Okay, continuing on in our housing prices uh, overall analysis. The previous video was univariate stats. Now I want to get into bivariate stats and visualizations as I'm going through to understand this data. I've learned a lot about my variables, about potential uh, departures from normality or normalcy here. Uh, now, let's take this to another level. I've got a great function for looking at my univariate stats. So I don't have to keep copying and pasting this function all the time. I'm going to go ahead and make a separate IPy notebook. But actually, no, I changed my mind. Let's make instead of a uh, .py file, .py file. I'm using Visual Studio Code. You can use anything. You can use text edit, uh, whatever you want. We just need to make a new file saved as .py. So I'm going to call this save. I'm going to go to my Google Drive backup and seek. Whoops, that's not what I want. Back here, I want, OK, class data. Let's put it in, you know, right here in this main folder. And I'm going to call it. Um, functions.py not as .txt do I have py here as an option yeah I know I'm off your screen on mine I can scroll down and there I do see python there we go whatever editor I don't know if this is even necessary just make sure you save it as a .py file I like keeping my functions in one of these um, I think it's slightly faster than a .ipy notebook uh, I don't want to use that I'm not worry about it okay I'm going to paste in my function, imports pandas, tab that, I like two spaces, okay. I think that's it. Save that like that, functions.py. Uh, come back here. Let's make sure now that it's saved that it's going to pop up in my cloud. There it is, yep, functions.py. I made this one previously, but I don't like that idea. Okay, with that file there, now what I'm going to do is... Um, Back up here to unit of stats. I have it there now. I don't need this. What I need to do instead is import sys. As you can see, during one of the moments I paused the video, I went ahead and mounted Google Drive so that I could see everything over here in my drive. And I am going to uh, add to it. It's uh, path. Oh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, yeah, it is path dot append to the path, the location of that file we just made. Has it popped up here yet? Functions. There it is, functions.py. Get that copy path, paste it in here. Um, oh, for, sorry, quotes first, paste it. I don't need the actual functions part because now all I need to do is say import uh, functions as fun. Why not? All right. Think that'll work it might need a moment to import uh, save and register but right here to use unit stats i just have to reference that object now all right that looks good test it one more time beautiful so i've got everything uh sorted just like before i'm pulling in my function from an external .py file functions.py uh like a, i'm going to keep this function here instead of putting it in the file because it's specific to this project in this data set uh, so I'll just keep it stored here in my housing prices. Whereas that other Unistats function, I really made it in a way that I can use it anywhere. So I'm going to keep it there uh, separately. All right, time to move on to bivariate stats. So this is often one of the uh, overlooked steps uh, when people are in a hurry to get to right into their projects. I, I like performing it anyway, primarily for the visualizations, um, but I'm going to run the stats as well. Uh, because this is something we've been learning and going through, and it's uh, still quite useful to see a comparison of what we're gonna what we're gonna learn from this is uh, based on a bivariate analysis of all of these factors, which of them have the strongest correlation or strongest relation or effect on sales price or label when we're just looking at bivariate relationships. So remember, uh, at this point, if I were to look at the effect of, for example, first floor square footage on sales price. It's ignoring the effect of all these other variables in a bivariate statistic. So uh, there's other reasons, too, why this will be useful when we set up a machine learning pipeline, why it's useful to see the difference between bivariate stats and the order of importance of those variables versus a multivariate analysis. So let's go ahead and run this. I'm going to bring in some functions I've already created for the three main types of bivariate stats that we do. So as a reminder here, uh, for bivariate, when we're analyzing the effect of a numeric to numeric variable, 
that means we're looking at correlation. Uh, Pearson correlation, assuming they're both um, uh, uh, normally distributed. Uh, there are other correlations uh, we can use, uh, Kendall and others, if it's not perfectly normally distributed, but uh, we're just we're going to stick with that one for now. Uh, so also by vary here, when it is a number to categorical variable, we're going to be using a one-way ANOVA. If it's three plus uh, groups, um, or actually, really, we, we, it's a, a t-test is for two groups. However, it's the exact same as a one-way ANOVA for two groups, the results are. But we'll still use a t-test to look and see if there are individual differences among those uh, two groups. Then lastly, if we had a situation where we're looking at categorical data to categorical uh, categorical uh, feature to a categorical label, then we'd be using a Pearson chi-square. Uh, however, um, in this case, our label is sale price, which is numeric, so we're not going to be using any chi-square. But let's go ahead and just make a function that will handle all of these things. We're going to go ahead and assume normal distributions, even though we already know that we don't have that with a lot of the variables. See all these skewness scores here that are well above one, or in some cases below, I guess nothing's below one. But at this point in the course, we haven't learned how to correct for that skewness yet. I want to save that for a little bit later. And for now, let's just assume that everything's okay and uh, we'll run these functions. So uh, let's start by importing or creating our functions to create those three things, as well as some basic charts for each of them and uh, pull all of those in. So uh, let's start with uh, our correlation here. Uh, so let's grab that that uh, code from some. Well, let's just make one def correlation. And what we're going to need for this is to pass in um, a data frame and then the name of the label so that we can loop through. Actually, no, in this case, we just want two variables. I'm going to change my mind already. Feature and the label. Because we're going to assume that this is a smaller function that's going to go within a larger function that will already have a data frame passed in. So in this case, we're going to want to return some sort of uh, uh, results, probably a p-value and a, let's make it a list here, uh, a p-value and an r, or vice versa. I think I made the function in the book is the reverse. So I'm going to go grab that function from the book. Uh, sorry, close out that tab. Let me reopen it here. Again, depending on which version of the book you're using, your chapter numbers could be different. Um, but look for the chapter on bivariate num, num stats. It's fun to say. All right. Uh, correlation, p-value, and scipy. So here's here's where we went through and did that in scipy, first of all. Uh, this one gives us both a correlation and a p-value. Yeah, that works. Not really any reason not to. Here's a version of it that, that, that uh, starts this process that I'm doing right now where it creates a, uh, a loop and goes through and runs a... a a correlation for anyone. However, what I'm going to do, um, you know, we already have this correlation function. I guess we don't need to recreate it. So let's do this. Let's pull in SciPy and pandas. And rather than call this a correlation function, I forgot that this one is really straightforward. We don't need a separate function for correlation. What I want to do is go ahead and start our overall larger function uh, for bivariate stats. So I'm going to call this uh, df five stats and here we will pass in a data frame and a label name so uh, I want to take this out because we want to be able to import the data outside the function so let's make a separate code block to actually test this in I know up here I put them both in one yeah, I could go either way you know what? I just I don't like confusing students so just know that I'm gonna keep my function call right here import pandas as pd but just know that this is separate remember that the function ends is going to end up here it's going to be defined up here it's going to have a uh, return value here uh, and that's separate from down here where i'm actually calling and testing out the function so let's test it by calling it here by stats and we're going to pass in the data frame that we pull in right here on the line above uh, and really, I can take this out because we've pulled in the data frame uh, up here um, on this import housing data. 
Anyway, so uh, buy stats, and then we got to declare the label, which is going to be not charges or in the housing data set. Housing prices full, and it is sale price like that. Okay, let me make sure I've got all this. Housing, oh, there's housing full, not housing prices full. Okay, perfect. So uh, let's take a look at, up here at our Vive stats so far. So we've created an empty data frame to store correlations and p-values. Uh, instead of calling it correlations and p-values, I'm going to call it to store output. And so I'm going to call this the output data frame. For now, I've got R uh, and p-values. So we, if we want this function to work for all three of these contexts above right here, then we're going to need to potentially have R. Uh, we'll call this F for an ANOVA. And then our chi-squared. Oops. Uh, then our p-value. So depending on um, which analysis is appropriate, it's going to give a value for only one of those three columns and an empty or blank for the other two. Anything else you want to add to this one for now? Uh, I don't think so. Maybe I'll think of something later. We'll call it good. Okay, so here's our loop. Uh, in this case, uh, we've talked about um, when we make these functions, the idea is we want them to work for any CSV file we pass in. And in this case, um, that'll work uh, if we have this loop here, because now it'll loop through whatever, however many columns are in this data set, it'll loop through all of them properly, um, regardless of how many they are. So that's why we've got this here. So for each column in this data frame that gets passed in, then we're checking to see if the data type is numeric. And if it is, if, uh, if the data type of the column is numeric, it's gonna calculate R and P. And we just changed the name of this output data frame right here. There we go. All right, so then to our output data frame, we're gonna add, kind of like up in our univariate stats function. By using .loc, it's gonna take the name of that column and put it in as a row label, like is happening right here. And then we're gonna round and pass in uh, our correlation. But now that we have f and chi-square in there, we better put in a couple of, uh, I like to put in a little dash. Um, I'm not putting in, uh, a numpy.null value or data frame none value. Uh, I'm putting that dash in because this is just a descriptive table. I'm not going to use this table as an input somewhere else. So I don't, I, I can put in a dash, that's fine. Okay, so what we, only problem here, uh, well, let's, let's run this first. So let's go through and have it check and see uh, for every column in this data frame up here, if it's numeric, give us that output, otherwise, it won't even include it in the table. So let's run and see if there's anything that I've missed here. Notice what this last line is doing right here. It's sorting by correlation R in a descending order. So I can see the highest correlation first. So let's run it and see if I've got some bugs. Sure do. I forgot I got to change label right here. Um, that's getting passed into right there. DF charges. We're not doing charges anymore. I'm putting in the variable label. So that way, down here when I call the function and I pass in sale price, uh, it's gonna pass sale price in here and then it'll automatically use whatever label name when I call this function. It'll automatically put it right there as the first variable and then whatever column I'm currently looping through as the second variable. All right. Uh, okay, so it says you've got some null values. It can't do this if there are any empties. All right, so we can handle this in a few ways. Um, if you remember from the debugging chapter, we could have a try catch where it tells us, okay, there's a null value, so it's not included. Um, we could also, within our function, just drop all columns that have null values. Um, or here in, uh, here in our loop, we could do that. So the way I would do that is by testing. So I think I'll do it before the if statement, um, since no matter what analysis I'm doing, if there's nulls, it's not gonna work. So I want to do, what I want to say is if, I have to reference the data frame, then pass in the column name, if df null dot is null dot sum uh, greater than zero, then we're going to proceed and continue to do this. If not, hmm, well, 
how about let's give them a message so they at least know why we didn't include a correlation for that particular column. So down here, what I'll do is I'm going to add to this output df. Uh, is that the best way to do it? Let me think here. So I could just come in here and say, all right, um, rather than passing in that value, I could say nulls. And they'll get that, hey, there were, uh, there were nulls there, and we couldn't, uh, we couldn't do anything about it. And I guess technically, if it's at this level, it's not going to go just in the correlation one. I'll just put it. Uh, actually, I think I like putting it in the p value. I mean, that's where we'll put it. Because that way it doesn't matter whether the data type was meant to be uh, you know, categorical to number, number to number, categorical to categorical. It'll, it'll give us that message regardless. Okay, so let's run that. All right, uh, same thing. So that means I'm still missing it right here. Still letting, allowing some nulls to get passed in. So here's what I want to do to debug it. I'm going to leave this part in the video because I want you to see the debugging process. So I put this in here thinking, all right, oh, yep, I can already see my bug. If it's greater than zero, proceed. I've got it reversed, don't I? Else it gives this message. So I want to do the exact opposite of that. What I was going to do to debug is just print out the value of this sum right here and see what it was. But I can already see my problem. I just got to reverse that. If it's if it's not greater than zero, so maybe I can say if it's just equal to zero, then proceed. Otherwise, uh, don't. Oh, Python. I forget. Double equals. I'm not assigning it a value of zero. I'm checking to see if it's zero. Okay, perfect. So I'm moving along here, and now I've got this one. It says basically what this means is I it can't do a sort if some of the values are text and other values are numeric. It's, or it has to either treat them all as text, or it, it can't convert these ones to numbers. So I'm, I can't use my dash anymore like I thought I might want to. So here's what I'll do instead. Let's change this dash to what's called an np dot nen. This is a, a, not a number, and it's a, it's a data type um, from uh, NumPy. Import. So I'm going to import NumPy now as np. And from here on out, if something, if I can't calculate it, we're going to call it uh, NumPy null. So I'll use that in place of all these dashes. Uh, so I have to take back what I said earlier. So if we run that, um, sort values by R, the other problem I'm going to run into, next let me show you here. So this works. However, it's not sorting it, well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, sort values, uh, this is happening on a copy of the data frame of output DF, not on the original. So I can do a couple things. I can just say in place, oh, I can't do in place with sort. But what I could do is switch this and use it here in my return statement, because now it's going to return the copy instead of the original. And that's fine because the copy is being sorted. So I can do that and it'll work. But here's the problem I get. Look, it's sorting negative 0.136 as below these values. But with the correlation, remember, it's not about how high or low it is. It's about how far away it is from zero and close to one or negative one. So what I really want to do is sort by the absolute value of correlation. So we can do that. Uh, let's come in here and change. You know, I really think what we could do is just say ABS right here on column R. Let's see if that works for us. Uh, no. What, so let's search for it. So what I want to do is find... Uh, I want to show you my process again. When you run into a bug and how to fix this, uh, this is one of the toughest... If my students can just learn how to solve these types of problems on their own, that's half the battle. So knowing what to search for, I'm going to say um, sort by... Uh, the absolute value of a, oh, right there, of a data frame column. Perfect. Already been searched for by someone. Sorting by absolute value without changing the data. Exactly what I want. So here's someone's example here of a very simple data frame. I'm guessing they want to sort by column B. This person says, here's what you do is data frame dot reindex and use data frame dot looks like column name dot absolute value dot sort values dot index. All right, we can do that. I'm going to grab that right there. Copy it over to my code, and uh, I'm going to put it right here for now because I don't want to lose what I've got here just so I can look at it at the same time and make sure everything looks right. 
So there's what I was doing before. Here's what the example is. So now what I want to do is apply what I saw in that example to my own code that I'm using right here. First of all, my data frame is called output df. So I'm going to change that right there, right there. My column name is r. So I'm going to change b to r. And remember, I'm getting r because my column is created right there. So dot abs, that's what I want. Dot sort values, yes. Uh, dot index. So it's going to re-index, I guess, based on that. That'll work for now. Uh, I'm going to leave this in here just in case we need to come back to it later on. All right, let's run that. Looks good. The only problem is it's still ascending. So I've got my highest here down at the bottom. So let me, oops, let me change this. I just got to add in my ascending equals false in here to the sort values. And I also notice I've got a perfect correlation of one because I left sale price in there. So uh, let's go ahead and get that out of there. There's no point in having that. So I'll add an if right here to get rid of if not call um, equal to label. So basically that's saying don't run this loop is if as I loop through the data frame, as soon as I get to the column that is also the label name that was passed in, don't bother calculating an effect size for itself. So that'll ignore that. That'll set my uh, descending. And then of course it hangs. There we go. Okay. All right. Over uh, order of importance in terms of correlation, uh, overall quality, the biggest factor, total square footage. That makes sense. Garage cars. So remember this is correlation, not causation. And the other issue is that many of these correlations are highly intercorrelated. So as a reminder of what that, what I mean by that problem, uh, let's pull this up right here. Uh, correlation ignores all the other variables and it's giving you a measure of effect size between the label and that particular feature. It doesn't understand that there's actually quite a bit of overlap between age, education, work experience, and that the true measure of one of these is just this part, this slice right here. The true effect size is just this part that's not overlapping with the rest of them. So again, the, the downside or the limitation of this bivariate analysis is I don't know how much of this correlation right here is also captured or covered by the rest of these. But it's a nice quick and dirty first glance at what's most important. So our p-values all along here are zeros. Um, here, as we get to some smaller correlation sizes, this makes sense. As the correlations get smaller, uh, the actual p-value or likelihood that what we found was due to chance also gets higher. So here we're still below 0 0.05, 0 0.05. We're partially significant here, but um, I don't put a whole lot of stock into p-value. I care a lot more about this effect size measure, but you can see as it gets bigger. Uh, what, what do I think? I actually think I want more than three decimals because I've got so many that are zeros. I wouldn't mind just seeing a few more decimals on that p-value. don't really need it with the correlation, I think, but the p-value would help. Oh, uh, yeah, then I'm getting into um, scientific notation. You know, I want to get rid of that. Let's search for um, uh, eliminate scientific notation python perfect beautiful let's find how do i suppress this in python um you need to manage precision yourself this is based on votes it's like i use percent f or dot format or i can use this string right here i think i like that one better um so that will show up to 20 i don't need that many let's see if that one works for us here so here when i'm printing out the results or inserting into the data frame. Oh, I better do it on a data frame. That's our problem. Um, let's say eliminate scientific notation data frame. Python data frame. Round df dot round. How to apply change format df dot apply. There we go. I like that. Use set option. Oh, I've got a bunch of options here. This is nice. Uh, Let's see here, where's that list they were giving us? Use that display format, the lambda apply reset float format. Oh, that goes back to the default behavior. Dot reset option display true. Hmm. PD options, I like that one, I think. Yeah, let's do that one. You can use whichever one you want. I'm just gonna apply this right now. I'll put it inside 
actually it's going to go here because here's where I'm importing pandas and calling it right there. All right, let's see what we get from that one. All right, beautiful. There we go. So, boy, really, really small p-values on all these. Great. Well, anyway, we've got a whole bunch down here that we don't have effect size measures for. So that's because these are all categorical. So let's go ahead and run an ANOVA on those and add that to our Vive stats function. So in this case, um, let me add an ANOVA up here before code. And let's make a function for it, ANOVA, um, because I actually think I gave you one in the book already for this. Let's go back and grab it. So this is our cat to num stats. Uh, here we go, ANOVA. Uh, oh, no, it's down here in Python. So what the, the trick here was to run a NOVA or a t-test, we have to separate the data out into this um, format where it's the column for in this example, education, is split up into five lists based on the five groups within that column. And in each list goes the numeric values associated with that group that are in the other variable we want to measure. So down here, if you remember in class, I'm not going to go through it all now. You can go back to the book. Just a reminder, this is the, this is the um, process I gave you for splitting up um, that categorical variable and the numeric variable into uh, groups of lists. So I'm just going to copy this and, whoops, oh, I hit back button. Didn't mean to do that. Copy that. Uh, I don't even think I need that one. I'm just going to grab up to that one right there and put this into our Nova function. Make this nice and simple. Okay, so this function needs all three of those things. We're not reading the data in here. Instead, what it wants, I've got these columns or these variables representing the feature and the label from the data frame. Um, you know, that's fine. We could just pass in a data frame with only the two of those that we need. There's a few ways we could possibly do it. I'm trying to think of the easiest way to set it up for us. I think since in our bio stats, we're already looping through a column and we know the label. Let's just go ahead and pass in, um, let's pass in a data frame expecting the column and the label. And, uh, yeah. All right, well, I guess we can do that right here. So this will be the, the label and the data frame. We can we could just have only those two columns or the entire data frame. Eh, I don't want to I don't want to waste time. Yeah, let's do that. So let's pass in a data frame of just the one that we need to be quick, but we're still going to need the column name along with the label. If I want to just use this code as it's, as it's already uh, created right here. So I'm going to get rid of that. And I already have column label built in here where I go through and I group the column. This is going to be the categorical feature. I think I want to, I think I want to go ahead and change it to feature. So I'm only going to call this ANOVA if the feature is categorical. So I'm going to plug feature in right there and right there. Label is used already right there. And group labels is created there. I think that's going to be all we'll need. So rather than store the results of this one-way ANOVA into the variable one-way, how about we just return those results right there. And we can get rid of all of these. I'm assuming you already remember this process, or you can go, you're going to go back through that video if you need it. So I'm just going to keep things simple and get rid of all those. Um, we also don't need all of our print buys. This is what we did in class to understand what was happening here in this bit of code. I think that's it. Let's run that and let's call it now down here where we need it. So as I'm going through for each column in the data frame, if it's not the label and if it's not null, then if it's numeric, do this. So here's where I want to add an else. If it's not numeric, then uh, we're going to pass in or call. Uh, let's see here, F comma P and that's going to equal ANOVA, and we're going to pass in that ANOVA. Rather than pass in the whole data frame, I am going to filter on that data frame and pass in only um, the column that we're on and the label. 
just to make it a little bit faster. So that way when I pass those in, it already has column label defined there, but I'll need to add in the name for column and then for label right there. Cool, I think that will work. I'm getting call from right here in the loop. I'm getting label from what was passed in right here at the very beginning. Okay, next let's add in uh, the actual one way ANOVA results. Sorry about that. Back here, I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna put it in right there. Let's change uh, now the first uh, in the when we add this a record for ANOVA, the first thing that goes in will be one of the nulls. The next thing that goes in will be the F score. Then followed by another null, then the P value. Perfect. All right. I think I want to change a couple of other things here. Okay. So now that we've got that in there, let's run and just test to make sure it works. Okay, perfect. Still sorting by R, but now our F scores are showing up down here. Let's uh, next, what I want to do is I want to sort by, let's see, a few things. I want to get rid of the count, th these ones where it's all null. I want to move those to the bottom. Sort by the F score. Um, yeah, let, let's sort by both. So which means I, I can't really use this anymore um, because this is going to re-index just based on one. But I still want the absolute value of R. So I got I have an idea. Here's what I want to do. When we input R, let's add another let's add another column here called uh, yeah, let's do it by I think I'm gonna change this R to um, stat. Again, this is all just personal preference. You can do anything you want here. And then what I want to put here is uh, I'll do plus or minus. And then on this one, I want effect size so that they're all in the same uh, column. Yeah, that may or may not be a good idea, actually, because then I get F's and R's in the same one. No, I can make I can make that work. OK, so then down here, the stat that goes in, I'm going to call this R. And then the plus or minus is going to be the direction of my R coefficient. Then my actual R will go in right there, followed by P value next. Okay, so here for direction, uh, I want to find out uh, what I'll do is go to Google and say um, get the sign of a number in Python. Now you can see that, but get the sign of a number. Oh, perfect sign. That makes it super easy. So let's come down here and put sign of, and then let's pass in R. And then we'll put in the R value itself. But in this case, we're going to put the absolute value of R. So that way we can still sort by R plus something else, but keep the sign separate and know when it's a negative correlation. And there's our P. So down here, we're going to do something similar except sign doesn't really matter with F because they're all positive. But here I'm going to put in the F uh, as our statistic and sign is irrelevant. So I'm going to leave that one as, well, that's fine. We'll just put in the sign of F. It'll still give us positive on all those. Um, absolute value doesn't matter. Actually, I wonder if I can just put in an empty like that, if that'll be a problem. Um, then right here, Let's put in uh, F and then round P as well. Then if it's empty or blank, there's no test. I think that might work. Let's see what this looks like when we run this. Oh, I've got one too many parentheses there, which means I do. No, I don't there just on that one because I took off absolute value. Sign not defined. OK, so maybe this is something that comes a sign in Python. Is this a NumPy thing? NumPy.sign. Yep, there we go. So we change that to np.sign. Let's see if it likes that now. Data frame has no attribute r. Oh, correct. So down here, we got to change this as well now. So what I want to do here is say output data frame. Uh, and this time we're going to do run sort values by again. And this time we're going to put in, uh, let's start with, um, well, either one, r, then f. And then out here, we're going to say uh, ascending equals 
Uh, let's see, is it false for both of them? Now that we have two, we can we can add in a different, you know, ascending for both. Yeah, I guess it's false for both of them. Oh, that's fine. Let's leave it like that and run. Uh, key error R. This is here still on our five stats. Is it on our still on our output? Yeah. Is R not in? Oh, yeah, I got rid of R. So I'm not sorting on that. I'm sorting by um, effect size, not R and F. Effect size, and then which stat it is, because I want to keep those separate. I might want to reverse that actually here in just a second. So here we've got our plus minus, oh, our stat is F here first. Oh, I see. So we've got all of our F scores. Perfect. So exterior quality is gigantic. Kitchen quality. Yeah, that actually that makes a lot of sense having bought and sold a bunch of houses. Um, if there's a foundation problem, I wonder if that's what that is. But those are clearly hugely uh, of gigantic effect sizes. So I think what I'm going to want to do on those is take a look at my visualizations, my bar charts, and see which values of exterior quality and kitchen quality and foundation, all of these were these gigantic F scores. I want to see which values seem to matter the most because I might be able to recode my data in a way down the road. I won't do that in these videos, but in a way that uh, simplifies some of those measures. So let's come down here. Looks like sign is not what I was looking for. Oh, I see. It's got the negative here. I don't want to print the one. Well, it, it works, I guess. So these are my positives. But then it restarted by my negatives. No, I see. Here's my here it is. So my largest negative effect size was this one right here. Kitchen above garage. People don't like that. Oh, no kidding. I don't blame them. That, that's what that means. So it's saying this has a negative effect and it's larger than this positive effect of having a porch screen or a pool area. So it is sorting properly with the highest correlations of the furthest from zeros are highest on the list. Um, but I'm not sure how much I like this column right there. I wonder if I can return the sign without the one. That's all I really wanted. Uh, but for now, I'm going to call it good. I'm sure you could. Uh, no, maybe I'm changing my mind already. Return this. Is there a quick way to get just back the sign? No, it's going to give me the one no matter what because I'm formatting it that way. Yeah, I'm going to call it good for now just because I want to move on. But what this, what this bivariate stats has told me is that I, I, first, I really want to look into these ones that are big, like overall quality, total square footage. Um, I'd like to see, or at least have a reminder of, of uh, how normal those things are. So I could come up here to my univariate stats and find overall quality. But look, I've got it sorted by skewness, kurtosis. So I might prefer to sort that by, here's overall condition. Actually, I'm good on that one. That helps. Total square footage. Where is that one at? Total square footage right there. That one does have some minor skewness, right skewed problems. All right, so those are my big, my variables that seem to matter a lot, but I've got some potential problems with those. So I better take a look at the scatter plots, um, especially of total square footage, uh, to see if we're going to have any issues. And then up here, I want to see the bar plots and the t-test to see what are the values of exterior quality, kitchen quality that are really driving this huge effect size. So that's the role of my visualizations next. So let's end this video for now, and then let's make some bivariate visualization functions next.